Good morning, everyone. We'll just wait a couple more minutes, see if we can get a couple more commissioners up here. Okay, good to know. Just not on. We saw Professor Hernandez in the uh, Scoop's office. He's here on the fifth floor. Good morning. It is 9.03 Thursday, June 1st, and I will call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Clerk, could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner McClintock. Kelly McClintock. <laughs> Commissioner Peterson. Present. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Alternate Dillis. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here yet. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. And you have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner McPherson, are you participating under a 2449 request today? Yes. Uh, and clarification, do, do we need to vote on accepting that uh, request? Commis Commissioner McPherson, if you can hear me, are you participating under the just cause one, which, you, which only allows you two per year or under the emergency circumstance? Both of them can relate to a medical condition. If it's emergency circumstance, then the board would entertain a motion to authorize the participation remotely, and, and then uh, Commissioner McPherson can participate that way. Okay, I don't know when it doesn't have surgery tomorrow, so that's why I'm not there today. So um, I don't know. Uh, so I, I would rec recommend that the commission do it as an emergency circumstance and then entertain a motion to authorize it. Second. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Schiffrin, second by Commissioner uh, Sandy Brown. Any public comment on this? Seeing none, we'll turn to the commission. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Chair, we actually need to do a roll call vote. Okay. On that, so. Sorry. I will call vote then, please. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Dillis? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Uh, Executive Director Preston, are there any changes to the agenda today? There are no changes. There's um, just a couple of handouts for items 22 and 28. All right, thank you. We'll now proceed with item four, oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. If 
you'd like to address the commission here in chambers, please approach the podium. All right, seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, Ms. Brian, are you able to share my video? Let me try and get that up. You're bringing it up. So um, included in the handouts, the letter we sent to Supervisor Cummings and con congratulating him for his appointment to the California Coastal Commission. What you're seeing in the way of the video is Manresa Beach, where the railroad tracks travel within feet of the Pacific Ocean. There's multiple areas where the coastal corridor, the railroad tracks travel on our coastal bluff. And basically, uh, it was, does not follow the Coastal Act approval to have a new passenger rail system here. And our expectation, expectation is that Supervisor Cummings, being on the Coastal Commission, will uh, educate us all and vote for no approval on the new passenger train as a board member for the Coastal Commission, just as he did for the RV overnight parking. Now, a lot of people will say that the public voted for a train. Well, uh, we disagree with that. They didn't vote for a train, nor could they have a train along the Coastal Corridor. And that's why the study is to look at horizontal and vertical liners. And the fact is that the, uh, the vote was very um, tainted, I'll say, by Roaring Camp. And if, if we all know, we understand that prior to that election, Supervisor, or Commission, uh, Executive Director Guy Preston proposed the interim trail. And there was huge backlash. And it's very frustrating that this board members did not support him. And that I was very embarrassed by that as a community member, that this board did not support staff's recommendation that they felt. They actually agreed with Warren Camp and, and listened to the lies being placed on them. And so um, I'm hopeful that members of this board apologize to Mr. Preston for not supporting him on his guidance. So thank you for your point. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Jack Nelson. Yes, good morning, uh, commissioners and RTC staff and members of the public. I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired uh, land use professional and environmental planning professional. Um, I'd like to suggest to your commission this morning that you have a responsibility that extends well beyond transportation. I, I think you realize how interconnected transportation is with other issues such as housing. I'd just like to um, bring back to your attention the question of uh, climate destabilization and assert that you don't have the right to only think in a silo about transportation without addressing what's happening with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, when I've tuned in lately to what climate scientists are saying in 2023, they're telling us in a very concise nutshell, it's worse than we thought. So for instance, you have glaciologist Jason Box doing a um, talk at a college on which you can find on YouTube with Jason Box, B-O-X, uh, telling us that on the Greenland ice sheet, a lot of melting is happening okay. due to uh, factors that are not in the climate models that are currently being used to forecast sea level rise. Uh, what he's saying is we're behind the curve on understanding what's happening to our climate. That's with the cryosphere, the, the frozen part of the planet. It's also with temperature rise. Uh, you may hear talk about keeping warming to 1.5 degrees, but that's global average. What's going to happen here in Santa Cruz County or in California on land? Much greater temperatures. So I'm here to bring this uh, to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Barry Scott. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, commissioners and Chair uh, Koenig. I, uh, this is Barry Scott. I live in Haptos, and I wanted to speak briefly to the interim trail versus ultimate trail um, options that seem to apply to all upcoming segments and current segments. And uh, I did. I was I was reviewing past uh, agenda minutes. And I found some interesting uh, points that um, I'd like to share. Uh, CEQA requirements is from June 3rd last year. Interim implies the need to consider the cost of putting rails back. We, we have to make sure that every time comparisons are done, that the interim trail is including those three phases. All three phases you can't compare phase one to a full project, in my opinion. And I think CEQA agrees. Uh, on April 21st, 20. 2021, Director Creston clarified that a grant cannot cover both scenarios, referring to in, uh, you know an interim and an ultimate trail. And therefore, once we get to a you know a grant phase, we have to we have to, in my opinion we have to stick with the ultimate trail. Um, we know that, for example, rail banking removes a railroad, and so a multimodal program becomes a single mode program. It's my opinion that the grants, the, the huge grants, and congratulations to RTC grant writers, <laughs> the huge grants are, are largely because it's a multimodal program for trail segments. And finally, in 2018, $50,000 was dedicated, thank you Mike, uh, Mike Rockton for the motion, $50,000 uh, dedicated to study a new crossing, a rail and trail bridge for Capitola. Later, that was, I think in 2021, <laughs> It was uh, reallocated to an interim design and spent to study interim use of the existing bridges. I'd like to see that undone. I think we need new bridges in Capitol or a new bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. Michael Saint, Matt Trust, resident and CFS team member. I'd like to share with you my thoughts on an observation I made this last year concerning the RTC Commission. I realize that the Commission has new members come in and older ones retire or lose their seats for whatever reasons. But what always seemed to be a constant was we will follow what the voters want us to do. This last year seemed to change after the 2022 Measure D failed last summer. Although you follow the voters' wishes and are studying the feasibility of passenger service on the rail corridor, it isn't without angst or criticism from some commissioners that this is a bad idea. I was shocked and dismayed that the commissioners during the first meeting after the Measure D was defeated by a wide margin were sowing the seeds of doubt and positioning themselves to support a trail only, no matter what the voting base wants. What happened to voter mandate? The first measure D barely passed, and that has been vehemently supported for the past seven years. Uh, on the other hand, we have a last year's measure D failing with 72% of the votes. And it seems certain commissioners are against passenger services on the rail corridor and will do what is necessary to make the project never see the light of day. The RTC is always banging the drum of we have a multimodal transportation project. Passenger service on the rail corridor is a big part of this multimodal project. What is left without the, tr the train possibility? Some painted bike lanes, some protected bike lanes, an ox lane with bus stuck in traffic, and maybe a trail only, which may be stopped at segment nine. I've put it as a rumor. If we are not only wholly on board with projects that are voted on, they have a high likely possibility of failure. A commission divided is doomed to failure, or at the very least will provide us with an inadequate transportation system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sain. We have one more speaker, David Loves Public Transit. Uh, good morning, can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi, I'm David Van Brink, I live in Santa Cruz. Uh, the voters will finally settle the first debate over rail versus trail by voting on Measure T, the Green Initiative, in the June 7th election. Interim Trail, the SRD, Ultimate Trail, and OMD. I'm reading from Manu Koenig's newsletter of April last year. The voters will finally settle the first debate. 
Uh, after that is a fair amount of slanted but reasonably accurate description of visual options. I also recall Mr. Koenig uh, reiterating here with great gusto. He didn't actually beg his show on the table, but he did state uh, quite forcefully, this vote will settle the matter once and for all. Greenway saturated the media with information far outspending any opposition. Greenway controlled the timing, the messaging, the texts. Voters had more information about this issue than any other. Now, of course, there's an apparently newish American tradition of claiming that votes that uh, votes we don't like didn't happen. It was rigged. People voted wrong or, or whatever. Uh, there was a thing in Washington, D.C. Uh, two, three years back. And for sure, there's votes that I wish I could just ignore. But that's not how it works. I was surprised last month when Mr. Koenig seemed to treat the temporary versus ultimate trail question as not finally settled. Was I hearing election denial? I was surprised. I'm sure it was just a momentary forgetfulness. I know your trained advocacy is just one item in a large portfolio of more important things. So I wish to kindly remind the gentleman from District 1 of his commitment to democracy, the outcome of the vote, which was not in question, um, and his stated enthusiasm to truly put this matter to rest. Let's move forward past non-existent controversy and trendy election denial. Let's build some bike paths like we all want to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. We do not have any more speakers. All right, we'll proceed with item five, which is action on the consent agenda. Or we'll proceed with the consent agenda. Are there any commissioners who wish to comment or have questions on the consent agenda? Yes, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I did, just wanted to say uh, I'm pleased to see uh, item number 11, the group the amending the Highway 9, Santa Cruz Valley, uh, complete streets corridor plan to fulfill the uh, federal requirements. Uh, I just wanted to point out that it's on this consent agenda, I'm fully supportive of it, and I know that the commission has been in the past and uh, will too, but, but um, I think this is a, a, an important step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? You've approved the consent agenda. We have um, Mr. Brian Peoples. Oh, sorry. Jump, jump too quick, sorry. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. I want to comment on uh, the multiple items that discuss the cost of managing the coastal corridor, the rail corridor, and the costs continue to rise. And this is a transportation asset that the community supported the purchase of. Um, that's called a transportation asset, and it's been sitting unused for a decade. You've built 1.2 miles of the trail over a decade. It's actually cost twice as much to build a 12-foot wide trail as it is to widen the highway. You're cutting down twice as many trees. The Coastal Commission will not approve a new rail system and you're holding up building the coastal trail because of this misguided understanding. Simply look at what the Coastal Commission did in the sense of approving the North Coast Trail. They didn't approve it. They only gave you a temporary trail, a temporary trail, temporary retaining wall. So, so what, what, what the cost that we're seeing on 13, 14, and 15 are not even included in the, the excessive cost of managing this property. And we're asking for us to start using this property and look at opening it up today. Um, please focus on opening it as a transportation commission uh, corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. We do not have any other speakers. All right, I'll turn to the commission. We have a motion from Commissioner Rodkin, second from Commissioner Schifrin. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commission Alternate Dillis? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Aye. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll proceed with our regular agenda, starting with item 25, which is commissioner reports. Does any commissioner have a report to share? 
Seeing none, we'll proceed to item 26, director's report. Director Preston. Thank you, Chair Koenig and fellow commissioners. Um, I have a couple informational updates. Um, first is regarding storm damage from March of 2023. Um, as reported previously, RTC staff is working to address damage caused to the Santa Cruz branch rail line by the winter storms of January 2023 and is working with FEMA and Cal OES to secure reimbursement to the RTC for costs of cleanup protection and repairs due to the, the January storms. Additional storms hit the area in March of 2023, which caused significant flooding in the town of Pajaro. Uh, the flooding caused some damage to the track in the town of Pajaro and the Santa Cruz uh, Big Trees and Pacific Railroad or Roaring Camp made the repairs and restored freight service pretty quickly. So thank you to Roaring Camp for that. Um, but the March 2023 storms also downed trees in the Harkin Slough area along San Andreas Road, uh, south of Manresa, and in the new Brighton Beach area. RTC staff work with our tree contractor, and all of the trees that came down during those storms um, have now been removed. RTC staff will submit a second request for public assistance to FEMA and Cal OES to recover the costs estimated at about $95,000 to remove trees and applicable staff time costs associated with the damage in March of 2023. And then one other um, update on what staff is working on. Um, uh, as you know, last month, the commissioners amended, uh, commended staff on the competitive funding leverage with Measure D funds. Um, your entire staff contributed to this effort and deserves great recognition for the success of this organization. That said, we wouldn't be where we are today without the help of the voters who passed Measure D in 2016, providing strength of strategic leveraging to the commission's toolbox of strategic planning and project delivery. In 2020, RTC adopted the inaugural 2022 uh, Measure D Strategic Implementation Plan, the 2020, excuse me, uh, Measure D Strategic Implementation Plan. The plan is a requirement of the 2016 sales tax ordinance and serves as the guiding policy and programming document for the implementation of regional Measure D projects. The implementation plan is required to be updated at least every five years. This summer and into the fall, staff will be working on updating the Measure D uh, strategic implementation plan, which we call the SIP. Staff will coordinate the efforts with this year's development of Measure D five-year plans, which we bring to you annually. As part of this work, staff will be looking closely at our matching commitments for reaching recent grant awards. Uh, maintenance commitments for the rail line and other expected expenditures. We will provide an update of the Measure D 30-year cash flow model for expected revenue and expenditures and better define our need uh, to finance um, to meet our financial commitments. We expect financing will be needed in the next couple of years to have enough cash on hand for all of our um, expected construction programs and other commitments. Finally, we will be engaging committees as we look to refine strategies to maximize the continued delivery of the Measure D regional expenditure plan. Although the SIP is only a snapshot in time, the timing is actually very ripe for an update and staff should be ready to present an updated plan to the commission to consider in November of this year. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you, Executive Director Preston. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Seeing none, does any member of the public wish to comment on the director's report? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? We do not have any hands raised. All right, it's an information item only, so thank you. Uh, we'll proceed with item 27, which is the Caltrans report. Mr. McClendon. Good morning, Chair Koenig, good, good morning, commissioners. My name is Kelly McClendon. I'm in a temporary assignment as the Deputy District Director for District 5 uh, for the Deputy of Planning. Uh, and I'm happy to be here this morning. I have a couple of updates on our construction projects and then one other general announcement. Starting with our Highway 1 Auxiliary Lanes construction project, now that we are in the construction phase of this project, I wanted to remind the, the public in general and this commission that it'll, it'll be an active and a dynamic construction zone throughout the next couple of years with completion anticipated for late 
2025. So we wanted to remind everyone to keep on the lookout for upcoming news releases as the construction zone and different uh, traffic management changes throughout that zone. We'll be releasing that information through our public information office through various news releases. So just a reminder about that. Uh, other construction projects going on right now, mainly up in San Lorenzo Valley, Highway 9, there are many different storm damage related closures. There are no full closures. All of the closures are currently operating under one way uh, reversing traffic control. And those mostly affect Highway 9 with many locations on Highway 9, as well as uh, one location each at Highway 35 and Highway 236. The last announcement that I'd like to make is a general announcement about an upcoming event for the AIDS Life Cycle Charity Bike Ride. And that's a charity bike ride that moves uh, from San Francisco to Los Angeles every year. Uh, the bike ride is over seven days and generally consists of over 2,000 riders and roughly 500 staff and volunteers. Uh, this will um, enter into Santa Cruz County on uh, Sunday, June 4th where the riders will be making the leg between San, uh, uh, San Francisco and then Santa Cruz. And then also Monday, June 5th, where the riders will be making their way from Santa Cruz to King City. Uh, so uh, please be mindful of the participants and um, keep an eye out for any news releases about road closures. And we wanted to remind the public to please anticipate for, especially for that Monday, uh, please anticipate uh, some disruptions in the normal traffic patterns to accommodate for the ride. And then also if, uh, if anyone's interested in participating or attending the event, uh, I know that that's uh, something that's also encouraged about that bike ride. That, those are my announcements and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. McClendon. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Seeing none, is any member of the public? Hey, Bruce has his hand up. Oh. Yep, I did, I, I did have my hand up, I thought. All Can right, you hear Mr. me all right? We hear you, yeah. go ahead. I just wanted to thank you. Um, of course, the, the storms really slammed the San Lorenzo Valley and I wanna just a uh, really huge thank you to Caltrans for its attention to uh, highways 9, 35 and 236. Uh, the big slide has been, uh, been corrected and it took a lot of time, but uh, the patience of the San Lorenzo Valley residents uh, is to be commended. Uh, it was a long time, but thank you very much for your direct attention on that. Appreciate it very much and uh, good work. We also uh, had some communications with the Caltrans personnel on uh, the uh, report on the, the line of uh, Highway 9 improvements from downtown Felton to the Santa Cruz, uh, excuse me, San Lorenzo Valley School Complex. And uh, we'll be having some town hall meetings on that in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. If there's no other commissioner comments, oh, yes, Commissioner Schiffrin. Yes, um, as we're moving into the summer season, uh, we're starting to get concerns about parking along Highway 1 on the north coast of the county. And, <clears throat> and oftentimes in a safe and way and um, concerns are that we've heard in our office are whether Caltrans is really doing what it can to protect the right of way and protect the public safety along that a particular area is in an area around what's called Shark, Shark Fin Beach and so I ask you to um, really look into that maybe coordinate with the CA only going to get more dangerous as we move into the July 4th holidays and into the summer. And, you know, the Caltrans right of way I know is difficult to um, enforce on, but it's really critical in terms of public safety. Let's give a follow up on that. Thank you. I took a note and we'll follow up on it. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffrin. So you know there are commissioner comments. Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on the Caltrans report? So you know one here in chambers. Is there anyone online? Yes, we have Linda Wilsherson. Thank you, my name is Linda Wilsherson and I live in uh, Live Oak. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. 
um, I live in Live Oak, and uh, I was wondering if Caltrans, uh, the Caltrans representative could let us know where we could sign up for email notifications about um, different uh, phases of the construction project between SoCal and um, State Park. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wills, Will Husen. Uh, go ahead. I'd have to double check to see if there's a distribution list sign up. Uh, I know what we're doing right now is sending out news releases to um, to a distribution list that's subscribed to the news releases. So I'll double check to see if there's a general project dis uh, distribution list. All right, thank you. And if you uh, let this commission know, I'm sure we can more widely distribute that to the public. Are there any other online comments? We do not have any more comments. All right. Uh, then we will proceed with item 28, our public hearing on the Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard and Coastal Rail Trail Segment 12 Project Environmental Impact Report and Environmental Assessment. I'll officially open the public hearing. Luis, did you want to make the announcement? Sorry, we have... Do, do we have our interpreter here yet? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, para todas las personas que ocupen uh, uh, interpretación al español uh, para este um, 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 uh, por, por el momento en, en, tenemos un intérprete aquí en, en la sala que puede pro, proveer los servicios de interpretación ¿Dónde, dónde se encuentra el intérprete en la esquina a su lado derecho okay. Al, al entrar por la, a las puertas oh, de la sala, estaría al lado izquierdo. Izquierdo. No, así que ahí encontrarán la intérprete si ocupan los servicios. Y también estamos ofreciendo esos servicios si están uh, con nosotros en Zoom. Por favor, levanten la mano y uh, los comunica comunicaremos con la persona que está en Zoom. Thank you. And I will proceed with a staff report by Senior Transportation Planner, Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, here today to, um, thank you. Can you do the presentation view? Thank you. Um, this is a public hearing to give the commission and the public a opportunity to provide comment on the Highway 1 auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder project, um, which also includes the coastal rail trail uh, segment 12. Um, sorry, real quick, give us a second. Okay, I'm Sarah Christensen, RTC staff. I also have our professional engineering consultant, uh, project manager, Zach Sevilla here, um, who's gonna be helping with the presentation today. Next slide. Okay, um, thank you team for um, explaining the interpretation that's uh, been made available for the Spanish speaking community who has joined us today, both in person and virtually. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is purely an opportunity for the commission and the public to provide comments on the draft environmental impact report, environmental assessment. Caltrans is the lead agency under uh, the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA and they are the lead for the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, under delegated authority by the Federal Highway Administration. The RTC is a responsible agency under CEQA because RTC has discretionary authority over a portion of the project, and that portion of the project is the RTC-owned um, coastal, or the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line uh, corridor improvements, which is the coastal rail trail portion of the project. Just to be clear, no action is being taken today on the project by the RTC. Comments received today will be recorded. We have a court reporter present to um, transcribe the verbal comments um, for the record. Um, and the comments will be responded to. Um, responses will be included in the final EIREA. Next slide. Okay, a little bit of um, information about the project and the program. Um, as you're all 
uh, familiar, this is the third and final phase of the seven and a half mile long auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder facility proposed along Highway 1. This is a multimodal uh, set of improvements. The first phase uh, is under construction now. Uh, you should be able to see a lot of the activities out there um, if you drove through the corridor today. Um, the second phase, which goes uh, just to the south uh, between the Bay Porter Interchange and State Park Drive, uh, will begin construction a little bit later this year. Um, that's another three miles of the facility. And today, uh, the environmental review for the phase three project is underway. Um, the uh, pending availability of funding, if we're successful in getting all of the grants that we've applied for, we are um, on schedule to um, complete final design in 2025 and start construction um, around that same time. So um, the project improvements include auxiliary lanes and a bus on shoulder facility from State Park Drive to Rio Del Mar and from Rio Del Mar to Freedom Boulevard. Um, it includes widening of the Aptos Creek Bridge um, which is a Highway 1 bridge over the creek. And um, the project includes a one and a quarter mile segment of the Coastal Rail Trail, which crosses Highway 1 twice and um, crosses over SoCal Drive twice as well. Um, next slide, please. And just to give a little bit of context and perspective for the Coastal Rail Trail under development, there's several segments under development. This is just a map showing um, what's currently under development by the city of Santa Cruz, which is segments eight and nine, and that's between the Wharf Roundabout, Pacific Avenue, um, and 17th Avenue. And then the county of Santa Cruz is um, working on um, the kind of early environmental phases of segments 10 and 11 of the Coastal Rail Trail, and that goes from 17th Avenue all the way to State Park Drive. Um, and finally, segment 12 will meet up with um, this trail network and um, propose the Coastal Rail Trail all the way through Aptos Village and down to Rio Del Mar. The funding for this project, uh, we almost have the funding. Um, hopefully we'll um, be successful in getting full funding soon, um, but <clears throat> we have um, a very significant commitment of, of the Measure D Highway Corridors funds um, that this commission has committed to this project. We also, um, earlier this year, were notified that we were successful in um, being one of nine projects nationally uh, awarded um, National Infrastructure Project Assistance Program or MEGA grant funds. Um, a portion of that grant um, goes to this project and a portion of that grant actually goes to Metro for uh, new uh, buses for them. So the total um, project is 180 million. Next slide. I'm gonna hand it over to Zach for the more detailed presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here uh, this morning. Uh, real quick, I wanted to just also inform the commission that this is uh, the third presentation that we've had on the project. We had two additional meetings a few weeks ago. One was virtual and we had a, um, a number of attendees and then we also hosted an in-person meeting as well. Uh, next slide. So just to start off with a quick overview, just looking a little more in detail at the project um, that Sarah described. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see the State Park Drive interchange. Uh, north is up in this image. And if we start along the main line of Highway 1, you'll see a few different colors. So what's shown in red, if you see at the State Park Drive interchange, those areas identify where the bus on shoulder facility would be uh, operating. So the bus on shoulder operates in between the on and off ramps at the interchange. As we continue to the right, you see the blue color that's on the outside of the freeway. That shows where the auxiliary lanes would be constructed. And then in between the interchanges, the bus actually operates in the auxiliary lane, both northbound and southbound. Uh, another thing to highlight on this image, uh, segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail is shown in that orange color. And you see where that crosses over the main line at two locations. And then the purple color denotes where there are structures. So segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail does have a few structures on it, um, crossing over the main line as well as Aptos Creek and Valencia Creek. Another thing to highlight on this uh, slide is uh, right there where section AA is shown, that's Moosehead Drive. 
Currently, Moosehead Drive is located within the state's right-of-way. So as part of this project, Moosehead Drive does need to be relocated outside of the state's right-of-way. Next slide. So for this image, we're now picking up just where that last image left off. So Rio Del Mar interchange is shown right there on the left side of the image. Again, you see the blue color denoting where the auxiliary lanes would be constructed on the outside of the freeway. The red color shows where the buses would operate on the shoulder. And then there's a rendering uh, right there in the middle that shows how that would look. So you would have two travel lanes and then in between the interchanges, the bus would operate in the shoulder. As we continue to the right, again, you see the auxiliary lanes between Rio Del Mar and Freedom Boulevard. And then ultimately the project uh, terminates at Freedom Boulevard. Next slide. So just to show uh, the project in cross section to give a little more um, clarity on the proposed improvements, the top two cross sections shown there, section A and section B, those show where the auxiliary lanes would be constructed um, where we're actually adding a lane in between the on and off ramps. And then in that section, the buses operate in the auxiliary lanes. Section C and section D show locations at the interchanges where the bus operates in the shoulder and the colors uh, match the colors that were on that previous exhibit. Next slide. As we look at section 12 of the coastal rail trail, we did uh, want to show a few different sections again um, to highlight the proposed improvements. What is being proposed is a 16 foot wide trail, a 16 foot paved trail section, and that's consistent through all of section uh, 12 and then uh, continuing across the structures as well. Next slide. We pulled together a few renderings again as a visual depiction to help show the proposed improvements for this one. Uh, this image is taken from the rail overcrossing looking north toward the State Park Drive interchange. This is what the facility currently looks like today. And if we go to the next slide, this is a rendering showing the proposed improvements. So in this location, there are uh, auxiliary lanes that are built. So we would go from uh, two lanes in each direction to three lanes in each direction. I do want to highlight that there was a tremendous amount of effort put into preserving trees along the corridor where possible. Um, this is uh, it's a very um, well-established corridor. There's a lot of mature trees along the outside of the facility. We did work with Caltrans to secure design exceptions for the median width so that we could preserve as much of the mature landscaping as possible. Next slide. This is another rendering. We imagine we just moved uh, south a couple hundred feet and we're looking at that overcrossing that that last image was taken from. So this is again what the facility looks like today. It's messed up fence. Story. And then next slide. And this shows the proposed improvements. Uh, the project does replace uh, the existing rail overcrossing structures. And then in addition, the project would construct new pedestrian overcrossings uh, for segment 12 of the coastal rail trail. Next slide. For this project, we're looking north at the Freedom Boulevard overcrossing. Uh, again, the existing uh, site today, two lanes in each direction. Go to the next slide. You see where the uh, project does include the bus on shoulder enhancements. So in between the on and off ramps, the facility doesn't get widened. The main line does not get widened. There is work in the shoulder to allow for the buses to operate in the shoulder. Next slide. And just to further clarify how the bus operates. So this is a unique um, operation. Santa Cruz County is the only entity in the state that has full legislative approval to operate buses on the shoulder. And so the image here shows that in between the on and off ramps at the interchange, the bus operates in the shoulder. And then in between those interchanges, the bus would drive in the auxiliary lane. Next slide. So just a little more uh, uh, project overview on segment 12 of the Coastal Rail Trail. As I mentioned, there are a number of structures that need to be constructed with the project. So there's two overcrossings of Highway 1, and then there's structures over Aptos Creek, Valencia Creek, and then also Soquel Drive. Next slide. For the structures that are crossing over the main line, uh, what's being proposed are cast in place concrete structures similar to what would be constructed at Chanticleer and then also at Mar Vista. We'll go through uh, more formal 
aesthetic design process on the look of those structures. This is just showing one potential rendering of what aesthetic enhancements are available with the project. For the bridges that cross over Aptos Creek and Valencia Creek, those would be um, prefabricated steel stru uh, structures. Um, that's done for a number of reasons. One is it helps minimize the amount of impacts that are in the waterways since those steel structures could be lifted um, from the adjacent roadways or banks and not have to have too much access into the creeks below. And again, um, all of these structures would be 16 feet wide consistent with uh, the rail trail itself. And this rendering is showing um, Soquel Drive out at Trout Gulch Road. And, oh, thanks. in this location, the trail would be built on the inland side of the rail line, and that would be consistent throughout the segment 12. Can I ask a question on that? Yes. Can I ask a question on that last slide you just had? So there's a lot of parking on there right now, so that, that's going to have to be removed, I'm assuming. On the right-hand side as we're looking into this photograph, am I correct? Overall, there are some um, proposed improvements that require parking removal, um, and that is in the environmental um, document. Um, the It's a little bit more complicated here because um, the RTC owns um, this property and there, there's actually an encroachment there right now with parking. Um, but um, that's not really considered official parking. So the, um, the, the parking removal, there's going to be some parking removal just, I guess, behind where this is looking on that parallel road, Aptos Street. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple parking that, spaces. That answers my second question. Okay, thank you. We own that right away. I, I also wanted to add, um, you know, um, that the project is um, carrying forward and, and analyzing the optional first phase, which is the interim trail. And the reason that um, we are continuing to um, include that is because um, we are managing the delivery risks for the project. So um, obviously there's the ultimate trail, which is the trail off to the side, which is all of the visuals that we've showed today. Um, but that requires um, acquisition of right of way and um, more involved permitting and environmental mitigation. And so um, in order to manage those risks, we have this um, optional first phase that would not require any right of way and would have less um, of an environmental impact. However, um, it still has, because there are tree removals required for the optional first phase, um, it's still a significant unavoidable impact overall for the project. So just wanna make sure that that's clear that um, that's included in the environmental analysis. Back to you, Zach. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so what we wanted to do next is just provide an overview of where we are in the environment, environmental review process and a quick summary of what's included in the document. Next slide. So this just shows a timeline of the environmental review process for the project. It started back in the fall of 2020 with the notice of preparation. There was a public a scoping meeting held in September um, to solicit comments from the community. And then that also helps inform the technical studies that were done for the project. Ultimately, that led to preparation of the draft EIR uh, EA, which was distributed for public comment. And that public comment period closes tomorrow. Uh, following closure of the public comment period, we'll begin working on the final environmental impact report and then ultimately work towards um, approval in the later part of the summer, 2023. Next slide. So a quick overview of the purpose of the EIR and EA. It's a joint CEQA and NEPA document because there are federal funds allocated for the project. The purpose is to identify and disclose physical environmental effects of the project, identify feasible mitigations or significant impacts, um, assess cumulative and growth inducing impacts, and then provide an opportunity for public input and uh, outside agency coordination in this process. Next slide. The technical topics that are included in the EIR are listed here on the screen. They include uh, in evaluation of the coastal zone, uh, growth impacts, 
traffic or transportation impacts, visual aesthetics, hydrology and floodplain impacts, water quality and stormwater runoff, paleontology, hazardous waste, air quality, noise um, analysis, energy analysis, uh, biological environment, cumulative impacts, and then also climate change. So it, it is a very comprehensive review of the effects of the project. Of that analysis, a number of resources were shown to have no impact or less than significant impacts. That includes uh, land use, uh, impacts in the coastal zone, parks and recreation facilities, growth, uh, community character and cohesion, relocation and real properties, environmental justice, utilities, traffic and transportation, hydrology, floodplain, water quality, hazardous materials, air quality, noise, energy, uh, plant species, wildlife, and climate change. So a number of resources uh, were um, shown to be less than significant impacts. Next slide. A few resources were shown to be less than significant with mitigation. That includes cultural resources. Uh, the mitigation measure is that if there are if there is anything discovered during construction, that construction activity needs to uh, pause and allow for people to evaluate what resources are discovered. For pa paleontology um, includes pa the preparation of a paleontological mitigation plan. And then for biology, there's other mitigation measures included to reduce the amount of time that's spent in the creeks. And that's done by looking at the construction alternatives and means that we have for building those bridges next to those sensitive habitats. There was one significant and unavoidable impact noted. As I mentioned, there are a lot of mature trees along the corridor. And even with the, um, the design changes that we implemented with looking at non-standard inside shoulder medians, we still did have a significant and unavoidable impact with visual aesthetics. And that's primarily due to the loss of trees along the, the corridor. So where we are in the process, uh, we are soliciting comments. Um, the comment period closes tomorrow. All comments need to be submitted in writing to Laura Pertania, who's a senior environmental planner at Caltrans District 5. So her email address and contact information is shown here on the screen. Does that appear on our website? That email, so the members can yes, be aware of it. Yes, it's on the project website. Yeah. And then just a quick overview of the project schedule. Um, as I mentioned, we are currently in the environmental clearance process, which is shown to wrap up later this year in 2023. We have initiated some final design activities, but that will continue through the spring of 2025. And depending on funding, uh, the construction is anticipated to start in the summer of 2025. And that is uh, that concludes our presentation today. Um, and we just to note, we have some project information for those in person, um, the project boards, and some information about the uh, environmental process um, over on the right side of the room here. So um, with that, we also have. Um, quite a robust team of professionals who are working on this project who are available online um, if we have um, questions about um, technical topics. So thank you. Great. Thank you for the presentation. And now just to clarify, you mentioned that uh, comments should be submitted in writing, but my understanding was we do have a court reporter here today. So any comments made verbally by members of the public or the commission will be written down and submitted in writing correct. automatically, right? That okay. is correct. Yep. Great. We'll begin with comments or questions from the commission. Commissioner Schifrin. I just have a question about the process. Um, normally in these kinds of uh, EIR, draft EIR hearings, there isn't um, responses to questions by consultants. It's just this is the time for members of the public or commission to make their comments. Um, so how does that work? There's a question and the consultant replies. Are those replies also part of the final EIR? Because I think it's uh, normally, as I remember, that's really not the case. Um, thank you, Commissioner Alternate Chiffrin. Um, that is a really good point. And um, the verbal comments made today will be recorded 
Um, we as a project team will do our best to clarify or answer questions um, to provide that information to the commission and to the public. However, um, responses will be officially in writing in the final EIR. Um, so our verbal answers, I guess, aren't um, necessarily going to be exactly verbatim the written response in the final EIR. I just wonder if there's any concern about having differences between what's said today and what's said in the final EIR in response to comments, um, causing confusion. responses. You're talking as the project team. The project team ultimately is not the environmental consultants, I don't think. And also the project team is in Caltrans, which, will be, which is the agency that is responsible for the EIR. So I'm just a little concerned about having different participants who really don't have a role in, at least at this stage, determining to the project and the, the consultant. So it's, uh, I'm, my point is really based on trying to avoid confusion so that members of the public will not think, oh, well, that answers my question. And it may, in fact, not really answer the question because the question legally needs to be answered in the final EIR or responded to. So I don't know, maybe our attorney can speak to this because I, I, I just want to avoid confusion around what needs to happen. So the, the consultants that are online are available to answer questions for the record itself and the final EIR will have formal responses to all of the comments that are identified uh, through this public hearing process. The, um, so there may be additional information today thank you sorry and and so I do think if the Commission has clarifying questions which I think was the point that Sarah was getting to that that the team Sarah and the team can answer those today but any public comments that come in on the EIR if you will in particular that go to the adequacy of the environmental analysis will in fact be addressed as part of the final EIR Yes, in writing. The question is, I assume that any responses to public comments would also be part of the administrative record should there be a legal challenge to the EIR. That is correct. Any comments made by the staff, by commissioners, by members of the public today as part of this public hearing are part of the administrative record for the EIR. Commissioners, will you please ensure that your mics are on? It looks like people on Zoom are having a hard time hearing you. All right. If, if, you, if you do have oh, damn thing. Just tap it. comments, just tap it before you make a comment, and uh, that way we know you're mic'd. Any comments, other comments or questions from commissioners? I can't see uh, the online Commissioner Mc, uh, McPherson at the moment. Okay. Um, I do have one. Cool. Did Commissioner McPherson, did you have a question? No? Okay. Uh, I did have one, one, one question, and maybe you could bring up the, uh, Mr. Zaviglia, the slide that shows the lane widths. I think yeah, it's, it's nine slide or nine. ten there. Yeah. Um, so the, my question is about the bus on shoulder facility. Um, we're, I think, Many of us here on the commission, particularly those of us uh, who sit on the Metro board as well, are excited about the bus on shoulder uh, portion of this project. Um, and I know I personally would also like to maintain the option to extend that bus on shoulder facility into the actual shoulder uh, that we're constructing um, on the, the rest of the project. Uh, which at this point it shows, you know, so the, the specific bus on shoulder facility that we're building today, as you can see in the red there is 12 feet wide, uh, whereas the new shoulder that we're constructing adjacent to the auxiliary lane is 10 feet wide. Um, is there the option in the future to pursue a project where the bus would run, would, would run in the shoulder next to the auxiliary lane? 
Yes, uh, that is a possibility in the future. However, we would have to um, work with Caltrans to get approval for um, most likely um, reducing the travel lane widths from 12 feet to 11 feet to free up another two feet on the outside. Um, that has a um, process to go through and um, Caltrans approval, which isn't always easy. So um, we definitely see this as kind of a first phase and there's many, many other enhancements that could be made later as future projects. Um, and I've actually been working with our planning team to um, hopefully get some, eventually get um, some additional planning um, done to expand this bus on shoulder facility and enhance it. Um, and we definitely also have been working with Metro staff because they have a desire to um, improve this. But we gotta, we gotta show some proof of concept um, and you know build something. It's, a, it's an innovative facility. It's the first in the state of a true bus on shoulder facility. Um, it wasn't easy getting approvals, just um, <laughs> uh, it was it was very challenging. So um, this is the first phase where we're kind of, you know, shifting to being more multimodal and um, hopefully give it a little time and it will catch on and become a more regular thing statewide um, as well as uh, here in Santa Cruz with enhancements. So hopefully that answered your question. It does, yeah. I was a little concerned to hear that we were already reducing the center uh, median width because that might limit the options. But I mean, as long as, uh, you know, in order to make the next step, I mean, obviously something that, as you said, would have to do uh, hand in glove with, with Caltrans. Um, I just don't want to have to rebuild a retaining wall in the future to get there, so. Agreed. Yep. Okay, glad to hear it. If there's no other questions or comments from commissioners, then I'll open it for the public. Anyone here in chambers wishes to uh, address us on this item, please approach the podium. Good morning. Uh, my name is Charlie Wilcox and uh, I'm here on behalf of the Seacliff Business Partnership uh, and the Seacliff community. Um, Seacliff Business Partnership is basically the Merchants Association in Seacliff. Um, Good to see you all. I'm really happy to see a lot of these things finally happening. I remember discussions with Guy when he first came on <clears throat> about bus on shoulder, and uh, I'm excited to see some of those things happen and, um, and see all of this happening. I'm really glad to see action. Um, it's been years. Sarah, seems like you're doing a, a strong job with that. Thank you. Um, I'm writing, or I'm here specifically uh, with the concern about the certain aspects of the EIR draft and adequacy, uh, mostly regarding uh, stormwater and <clears throat> the stormwater drainage through Seacliff and the impacts of these projects and related and concurrent projects. Caltrans uh, has project in uh, uh, doing drainage and uh, other improvements on Highway 1, as well as the other auxiliary uh, lane project that's happening there, and these uh, bus and lane projects. Um, and in the EIR, it seems as though <clears throat> the cumulative effects were not really well backed up, um, or uh, factually, uh, the findings of uh, uh, low impact were not really factually addressed. Um, we're providing written comments with more detail about this, uh, which we you know, hope to have addressed. I just wanted to raise awareness around that. Our particular concern is uh, with increased flow through potential open channels and public danger that that um, can create, particularly with having a trail right near that and kids going and playing in ditches and this kind of thing. You know. Um, that's one of the worst things we could possibly imagine. So um, that's, uh, that's really the concern we wanted to raise, but really glad to see all of this moving forward and the hard work of this group uh, being successful. So uh, look forward to talking to you more and hearing the responses from our written comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Anyone else here in chambers? Please approach the podium. Good morning, Chair Koenig and commissioners. Uh, I'm Matt Farrell. I'm here speaking today for Friends of the Rail and Trail. Uh, I'm going to address two items we raised in a letter to you on May 29th. The first is our concern that the interim trail is, in, in our opinion, improperly treated as a distinct alternative. 
the optional first phase interim trail is simply one portion of the entire plan for the rail trail project and the impacts assigned to the interim trail should reflect the cumulative impact of all phases of the project. Therefore, any impact from the ultimate trail configuration should be common to the interim trail. And we've raised specific issues around relocations and property acquisition, and secondly, utilities and emergency services, with a more detailed description of our concerns in our May 29th letter. Lastly, I'd like to speak about the regulatory, requir regulatory requirements not noted in the draft EIR. Um, the interim trail requires the approval of abandonment by the Surface Transportation Board and a negotiated agreement with the freight carrier of record before a certificate of interim trail use can be assigned, can be issued. Additional approval by the California Public Utility Commission also is likely to be required. These approvals and requirements should be noted as an additional requirement under the optional first phase interim trail. Um, Sally Arnold, in respect for the two minute limit, is going to address the third topic in our letter. So I'm going to turn it over to you and try and respect the two minute limit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Sally Arnold, also on the board of Friends of the Rail and Trail. And I just want to say how exciting it was to see those renderings of a 16 foot wide trail going through Aptos. That's fabulous. Um, and I know that's an incredibly wide uh, bike and pedestrian trail and unusual in our state to be that wide. Um, while we're reviewing the D draft DIR um, and related documentation, we did notice um, uh, some conclusions that were made. One was that the auxiliary lane project has substantial environmental impacts, some of with no chance of mitigation, including the removal of over a thousand trees and over a 2.6 mile stretch of highway and permanent impacts to grasslands, live oak, woodlands, and coastal riparian zones. It also noted that the auxiliary lane project, the traffic operations report showed that the morning commute on highway one will be made slightly worse by this project. And that while the evening southbound commute will be improved in the near term, by 2045, the southbound commute will be just as bad as it is now. And this is because of the well-documented phenomenon of induced travel. Colloquially, if you build it, they will come. You build a lane, they're gonna fill it up with more cars. Um, the total cost of the highway widening project included um, and um, related projects is already known to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars and it might approach a billion dollars by the time this whole thing is com completed. We're raising these points to highlight that the common criticisms of rail, proposed rail transit in Santa Cruz County are really just general criticisms of infrastructure development and are in no way unique to zero emission rail transit and trail projects. All infrastructure projects are expensive, they all have environmental impacts, and none of them will eliminate traffic. All we can do is offer people choices to get out of the traffic. We cannot stop that traffic. However, it seems like some commissioners sometimes hold different projects to different standards. And we hope that you will note that these are three problems common to all infrastructure projects and you will hold all projects to the same standards. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Good morning, RTC commissioners. My name is Susan Cavalieri. I want to remind you that the weather events of the recent past, severe drought followed by multiple atmospheric rivers of this past winter will worsen in intensity as greenhouse gas emissions increase. According to the 2022 Santa Cruz Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, passenger cars contribute about 51.2% of county emissions. Reducing this traffic is essential for emissions reduction. Unfortunately, widening Highway 1 by adding auxiliary lanes will promote induced travel, eventually increasing the number of cars on the road, leading to more congestion and more emissions. Adding public transit to this plan will not encourage bus ridership as the bus um, 
will not in encourage bus ridership because the bus will have access to a bus lane for a short distance before moving back into traffic. This is not true bus on shoulder where the bus has its own dedicated lane and is not impeded by congestion. As the bus is a better option, drivers will opt to take the bus instead of driving. You may be aware that LA is looking to pilot congestion pricing on roadways to include a section of freeway, which would, and I quote, reduce harmful air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions by pushing more commuters to use public transit. Please prioritize true bus on shoulder for Highway 1 to provide similar benefits for those who use our highway and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at this critical time for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cavallari. Is there anyone else here in chambers that wishes to address us? I, I see you, sir, but uh, if there's anyone else, please go ahead and form a queue so we can get, uh, get through the comments efficiently. Hi, I'm Dan Holdren. I've lived in Seacliff since 1960. Uh, I was instrumental in putting together the village plan. Um, we have a severe drainage problem that was uh, tried to be addressed here and it hasn't been addressed as of yet. Uh, my neighbor who's upstream from me, um, Brad, uh, had to be on a jury today. Um, but the erosion is bigger than a car in many, many places and it's collapsing. I'd like to see this rail trail continue and I'm very supportive. I just would like to see the downstream person be um, looked at because it's, it's really affecting us as it is now. The local uh, motto is think local. And I'm very blessed to have Mary Ann's as an anchor tenant. They've been in business for over 70 years. I'd like to see everything continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holdren. Morning. Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Saladin Sale. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. I applaud the commission and staff for the remarkable progress that's been occurring since last year's crushing defeat of the Greenway proposal to permanently kill rail transit. I wish to comment on the draft EIR. Last year's Measure D election was hailed as finally putting the question of rail transit to a vote of the people. Unfortunately, the same die-hard anti-rail zealots who promoted Measure D are now suggesting the election results are not to be believed because the poor voters were confused. If there was and remains any confusion about their failed trail-only proposal, it's because of the continued efforts to promote the so-called interim trail as a viable alternative to the ultimate trail next to electric light rail transit. There is only the ultimate trail and the no build alternative. The interim trail is a fantasy because federal approval to tear out tracks over the objections of a working railroad has no precedent. The STB won't isolate Roaring Camp by allowing the removal of the tracks it needs to access the national rail network especially in the face of the opposition of 73% of the voters in the impacted area. Approval of the California PUC is also likely to be required and unlikely to be obtained. The interim trail is thus not a viable option and would only mean stopping all the progress on rail or trail and entering a long legal fight for nothing more than the faint hope that property owners along the trail rail corridor might hit the jackpot with a payout for renegotiating rail easements to become trail easements. The requirements of approval and abandonment are unique to the optional first phase interim trail. S.7 needs to be revised to note these approvals and agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sale. Is there anyone else here in chambers? Seeing none, is there anyone online? Mr. Brian Peoples. 
Hi, it's Brian from Trailnail. I want to, I've already submitted our comments, but I want to address the specific question that Commissioner Brotkin asked about on the parking lot ownership. And Sarah's statement was not correct. And the property owner's lawyer for that property has sent multiple letters to the RTC Commission. And the specific legal ownership is by the property owner there. RTC only has an easement, and that easement specifically says freight train only. So you can't have a passenger train. You can't even have a trail. So it's important that staff be clear on that because it was very confusing that that was communicated, that it's owned by the RTC. It's not owned by the RTC. There was actually a title error when the RTC purchased it. The title company made an error and the new owner uh, title company came back and showed the true record that it's an easement and it's freight train only. So the likelihood of getting a trail, taking out all that parking is not very likely. And this is just another example of how it's unrealistic to have uh, a train and a trail going along the coastal corridor. And this is why it's costing us so much time and so much money. It's taken decades and it costs twice as much to build a trail as widen the height. So I encourage you to be, look at that specific requirement on legal ownership of that parking lot. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peebles. Jack Nelson. Mr. Nelson. Yes, I was just finding the unmute button there. Uh, I'm Jack Nelson. And so what about the environmental impact of continuing to widen Highway 1? Well, let's start with the private passenger vehicle is the most energy intensive transportation mode. And um, mostly what's out there on the highway today is fossil fuel powered vehicles. It's not electric cars, which do also have their own high energy demand. Uh, so in the time of climate change, which the UN Secretary General calls a quote, code red for humanity, Santa Cruz County is spending a large portion of funds expanding the wrong transportation mode, even though as uh, other speakers have pointed out, the commute will not be fixed. So what might a moral philosopher say about this situation? Well, um, Kathleen Dean Moore uh, was in that role as a professor at Oregon State University, and she's written several books uh, on these uh, environmental and moral questions. And I think she, she might say that it boils down to a single sentence. It's wrong to wreck the world. Now, what will future human inhabitants of this planet say? Well, facing climate chaos and the possible breaking down of civilization, I think they might be saying that expanding the global greenhouse is a crime against humanity. And yet, commissioners, you have in front of you alternatives to address the public's money in getting us out of cars and onto other transportation modes. You have that power. You're the decision makers. Where are you? Why aren't you speaking up about this climate crisis? Please understand, look, see, have a heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Koenig. Uh, Michael Saint here with CFST. Um, as you already know, <coughs> the Ox, <coughs> Ox Lane project has always been a bone of contention for CFST as well as other advocacy groups in Santa Cruz. Um, and I'll first start out, my comments have already gone into Laura, so I'm not going to repeat what other people have been saying. Uh, this is not a true bus on shoulder by any means. Um, and the reason you say it's the only one, it's actually a hybrid system. 
and it's never been tried anywhere before, and there's a reason for that, because no one really thinks it's going <laughs> to work as designed. Um, I suggest, and we're not the only ones in the state, I would suggest you Google San Diego's Bus on Shoulder Project to see a true bus on shoulder, which we aren't doing. Um, also, there's been no alternative study done on this segment 12, as well as any other of the Oxlane projects. Uh, you're only comparing to the no-build alternative, so that's a weakness in the EIR. Uh, I would also like to remind all commissioners that we are supposed to be using the new CEQA guidelines, which this EIR follows and it has to be under. Uh, we are no longer required to use level of service, which was the old way of doing planning. Uh, CEQA guidelines include presently limiting vehicle miles traveled and thus lowering greenhouse gas emissions for transportation projects. This EIR on this segment does none of that. So um, our comments are in. I hope you take it seriously. <clears throat> and the last word's not been said. That's all I can say. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Sain. Jean Brocklebank. I'm speaking first, and then my husband, Michael, will uh, also want to speak from this screen. I thought this was a hearing on the environmental impact report, but many speakers are using this as an opportunity to talk about everything but the, the adequacy or, or inadequacy of the EIR as a document decision, uh, document, uh, decision making document. I would like to make a correction. A speaker earlier referred to the interim trail as an alternative in the EIR. This is not true. There is only one official alternative in this EIR to the proposed project, and that is the no-build alternative. There is no interim trail alternative. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the basis of our complaint. The EIR assumed there would be two bridges at each of two crossings over Highway 1. There was no alternative that would have had only one bridge at both of those two crossings over Highway 1. Also, we have submitted our formal co uh, comments already. Caltrans has them, the RTC has them, and all of you commissioners now have them. Um, I, I will repeat the speaker before me and encourage you to take the time to read them. They're in PDF form. There's only two or three pages, and we made some really excellent points on the adequacy, <clears throat> excuse me, of this environmental impact report. The EIR does not pass muster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bacobank. <clears throat> Mr. Michael Lewis. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've studied this EIR very thoroughly over the past couple of weeks, and it's very clear that the segment 12 component of this project was um, inadequately covered. It's very, uh, there, is, um, there are no plans for the segment 12. There are no plans that show the trees. There's no uh, tree inventory for segment 12. The segment 12 has uh, gotten a short shrift in this. There's no vigorous analysis of segment 12 in this EIR. It's a very, uh, very important uh, insufficiency of this EIR. It's clear that there are two projects here. There is segment 12 and then there is a highway. They have different objectives, they have different needs, and they should be uh, separated and conducted as two separate EIRs. It was very puzzling why this was done, but now after hearing the uh, presentation tonight, I come to understand that the segment 12 was added to the highway uh, project in order to call this a multimodal project and that way have access to uh, greater funding. Um, that's not adequate uh, because of the nature of the two projects that are different. There can be no reasonable alternative to the proposed project that covers both of those components of the project. It, uh, if you were to have a uh, trail only alternative, it would not apply to the highway part of the project. So therefore you could never have an alternative 
that covers both segments, both components of the project adequately. So we suggest very strongly that you restructure this EIR so that Highway 1 project is separated from the Segment 12 project so you can do a rigorous analysis of both individually and come to conclusions of environmental impacts related to those specific projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Rick Longinotti. Are we muted? Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm submitting comments at, on behalf of the Campaign for Stable Transportation. And I want to inform you of some of the, what those comments are about. Um, the, the EIR, draft EIR, is tiered from the T, tier one EIR that was uh, completed in 2019. And that EIR was invalidated in court last summer, as you might recall. So if you're tiering from a, a, an EIR that was invalid, um, you're not going to have a valid tier two EIR. Um, the, the, EI, the draft EIR, does, as another speaker has said, um, doesn't uh, uh, provide, doesn't analyze project alternatives. There's only uh, the build alternative and the no build alternative. And, and this is a violation of CEQA. You need to analyze possible alternatives that would meet the objectives of the project. And, you know, most egregiously, the, the draft eliminates the bus, what it calls bus on shoulder only from further study. That's, that's genuine bus on shoulder. That's a bus in its own lane on the highway. And that was eliminated from further study unjustifiably. Um, the draft uh, does, it, it tries to make an end run around the vehicle miles traveled analysis that's mandated by CEQA. Uh, it claims that these auxiliary lanes are exempt from that analysis and, and also exempt from uh, mitigating increases in vehicle miles traveled. So what we have here is a very badly flawed EIR that puts the uh, other projects in jeopardy that are that uh, you know the bike pedestrian and and transit projects that are part of the thrust of this uh, of this effort. Um, the benefit, the the as another speaker has said, uh, congestion relief benefits will be non-existent in the morning direction and short-lived in the afternoon peak direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Longinotti. Mr. Barry Scott, that's our last speaker. All right, uh, thank you, Commission. Um, I uh, am, am uh, happy to see the, the documents uh, made available, and I want to uh, say that I'm a, a supporter of the full project in its ultimate trail configuration, even though I may not support highways as a, as a rule. That section is, is extremely narrow, and it just makes sense to even out the width of uh, the highway corridor. I, I am opposed to single passenger vehicles, uh, but am happy that a third lane can be later committed to a transit only or, or HOV or, or other you know, greener uses. But we need, we need to straighten out the problem in, in APCOS and I support the full project with the, that keeps the, the rail, uh, builds new rail bridges and keeps an ultimate trail. Uh, deficiencies that I find in the EIR are, are, are two. The, uh, even though it said that only one alternative, a no-build alternative is mentioned, when I look at the summary, uh, uh, cover summary and table of contents section, I see, uh, for example, summary of potential impacts from alternatives. They mentioned build alternative, optional first phase, next to build alternative, ultimate trail configuration, and then the no-build. So I'm seeing three alternatives. And the optional first phase is, should be treated differently. It should, it, it should include the full impact of, the, of all phases. You can't just pretend there's an optional first phase and that's all there's going to be. The other problem is an optional first phase would require rail banking. And when I get down to the S7, page S12, section S7, necessary permits and approvals, I don't see the uh, CPUC or the Surface Transportation Board mentioned. If you do anything, if the RTC or Caltrans does anything that involves removing the rail line, you've got to get those approvals. So uh, that's a second deficiency. Uh, inclusion of the Surface Transportation Board as a, as a necessary 
approving agency. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Paula Bradley, Bradley, sorry about that. Thank you. I'm Paula Bradley. I'm a Capitola resident and I would like to support proceeding with the final EI, EIR EA without further delay, consistent with for the ultimate trail, consistent with the will of the voters. I prefer that the bus auxiliary lane be dedicated to public transportation, not shared with vehicles resulting in inefficient public transportation with the buses stuck in gridlock with the vehicles. I'd also like to thank the RTC staff who've done an outstanding job of obtaining funding to proceed with the project into the construction phase. Job well done, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Sean. Sean, are you there? Sean. In addition to the, uh, uh, the lack of uh, noting the cost of rail banking, um, surveys show that the majority of the, uh, uh, of, of the morning traffic is going beyond Watsonville. Watsonville bears the brunt of uh, the smog, um, the wear and tear on the roads, all sources of pollution uh, caused by drivers, and uh, just the, uh, the increasing costs of uh, repairing the infrastructure. RTC is for the county, so it's not just about Santa Cruz's needs and what some people like to refer as, to as uh, Santa Cruz leaving out Watsonville. And the only reason we talk about interim trail is because of the, uh, uh, the, the Greenway board members on the RTC. The language interim trail was voted on because it was something that was in, you know, uh, continued to be put up as a, uh, as a possible alternative. That, that has been answered over and over again. It's, it's, it's not an option. The RGC is wasting money and time, which is to the benefit uh, and caused by the uh, the, RT, uh, the uh, Greenway members on the RTC. We need to move forward and uh, you know with uh, and, and speak about things that um, you know are a reality and are becoming a reality and are funded for you know for those good reasons. Thank you, Sean. Diana D. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. So not. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Um, good morning. I just wanted to um, reiterate many of the comments that others in support of the ultimate trail have made, um, but I won't list all of those. You've heard a lot of them. You're getting a lot of letters and comments on this, this project. Um, I am in full strong support of like 73% of my, uh, the rest of my <clears throat> county in <clears throat> uh, keeping the option for uh, rail and in the future. And I hope it's not in the distant future. We need to get this thing built and all these delays um, that have been caused by bringing up so-called alternatives like the interim trail is wasting a lot of our money, our staff time, and um, we need to just move ahead with what the community wants and what the climate needs. I don't need to go into that. Uh, I really hope that you will recognize that both the federal and state government will be funding projects like this for a long time because that's what we have to do for the future of our county and for the world. Please keep that in mind. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diana. That was our last speaker, Chair. All right, I'll turn to the commission. This is a non-action item. I don't know if there's any final comments or questions that have come up. Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, yeah, just one uh, follow-up from uh, one of the uh, speakers who stated that this EIR is being tiered off the HOV EI EIR. That was not my understanding. My understanding is that this is a totally separate EIR, is that correct? You are correct in that it is a separate standalone environmental impact report, environmental analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. All right, seeing no other comments or questions from uh, commissioners, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you, staff uh, and consultant, Mr. Zaviglia, for the presentation. Thank you, excellent presentation. We'll now proceed with item 29, which is the potential Go Santa Cruz County Bicycle Incentives. And for a presentation on this item, we have Amanda Marino and Amy Naranjo, Transportation Planners. I just have to share it on this side. Sure on the top. On. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Uh, my name is Amanda Marino, and I'm a transportation planner for the RTC. I'm here today to provide an update on the proposed uh, bike incentives pilot program, and this is a part of the RTC's TDM program for Go Santa Cruz County. The proposed uh, purchase incentives will be targeted to low-income individuals to assist them with purchasing regular bikes, electric bikes, and also e-bike sharing services. Some of the reasons for developing the bicycle incentive pilot include helping people replace car trips with regular bike and e-bike trips to reduce VMT, increasing access to bicycles for all income levels, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Staff presented the proposed pilot program first shared with the commission back in April to the Bicycle Advisory Committee and the Interagency Technical Advisory Committee. The following slides incorp um, incorporate updated criteria for the proposed pilot that um, was received by the RTC Advisory Committees, partner agencies, and me members of the public. To participate in the program, applicants should be 18 years or older, and staff are considering including community serving organizations as eligible applicants. This would potentially allow community serving organizations like shelters and job placement programs to initiate their own bike lending fleets. Incentives would be limited to one per individual or potentially a community organization. Applicants must live or work in Santa Cruz County and must provide proof of enrollment in a verifiable, verifiable low income assistance program. And lastly, applicants must complete an online bike safety course along with a baseline survey. Applicants may request also a free helmet and light set with their voucher after completing the bike safety course and the baseline survey. Staff are recommending the following point of sale vouchers for the proposed incentive program. A $300 point of sale voucher to purchase a regular bike, uh, commuting bike. $800 for a class one, two, or three e-bike. And $1,200 for a cargo or adaptive e-bike. Vouchers could be redeemed by any participating local Santa Cruz County bike retailer. Staff are recommending the inclusion of class three electric bikes to, to the list of eligible bikes. Class one includes pedal assist with a max assisted speed of, speed of 20 miles per hour. Class two is throttle assist with max assisted speed of 20 miles per hour. And class three is a pedal assist without a throttle and a max assisted speed of 28 miles per hour. 
To reduce the additional upfront costs, eligible applicants whose employers are enrolled in the Ecology Actions Employer Membership Program can apply for a zero interest bike loan to cover the remaining upfront cost of purchasing an, a regular bike or an electric bike. In addition, Bay Federal and Santa Cruz County Credit Union offer low interest bike loans to qualified applicants for the purchase of a new e-bike or regular bike. Um, at the, and several local re bike re retailers also offer a ride now, pay later deferred interest financing. The Regional Electric Bike Share Program is scheduled to launch later this month with docking stations located throughout the City of Santa Cruz and UCSC. It will then expand to Capitola, Watsonville, and the unincorporated parts of the county, including Cabrillo College in early 2024. The countywide working group leading the bike share efforts consists, represent, consists of representatives from the cities of Santa Cruz, Capitola, Watsonville, the county, UCSC, and Cabrillo College were able to negotiate discounted annual membership rates with B-Cycle for UC, UCSC students and affiliates. Staff are looking into ways to, to collaborate with the regional bike share working group as bike share expands throughout the, the county and potentially offer discounted annual or monthly memberships for low income individuals. We'll have more information on this um, potential incentive in the coming months. The, the pilot bike share program, or sorry, bike voucher program, is likely to be funded through a combination of sources. Staff are preparing an application for the AB 2766 Emissions Reductions Grant Program to submit to the Monterey Bay Air District. Staff intends to request, request the maximum funding per project application, which is $400,000. Staff will also apply for the regional competitive funds from the RTC in the fall. These funds could be used to supplement the potential funding from the AB 2766 grant program and help make bike voucher program available to more participants. Vouchers will be offered on a first come first serve, first serve basis until all funds are exhausted. The more funding that the RTC can secure, the greater number of vouchers that will be provided to the community. Funding for discounted rates for income qualifying, qualifying individuals for the regional electric bike share program is still to be determined to line up with the, with the timing for the countywide launch. To promote the pilot program, staff are considering using a combination of bilingual online and offline marketing tactics. This includes bilingual Go Santa Cruz County bike incentives page and a new web page for the pilot program, bilingual collateral materials, including brochures and posters, promoting the program at various local community events and festivals, advertising the program through our various mailing lists, social media channels, and online ads, partnering with local retailers to promote the pro program in store, reaching out to local media outlets to generate buzz and awareness about the program. Furthermore, staff is working to prioritize outreach efforts in South County to promote the Go Santa Cruz County program and the bike uh, pilot voucher program in areas where likely to be more income qualified individuals. Staff met with the city of Watsonville to collaborate on outreach efforts and strategize ways to engage with South County residents. Activities under development include signage for the Watsonville Transit Center, Go Santa Cruz County banner over Main Street in the plaza. We're also considering tabling or advertising at the following events um, in South County, which include the El Mercado Farmer's Market at Ramsey Park, the Watsonville Flea Market, local grocery stores, affordable housing developments, for example, Mid-Pen Mid Housing and Eden Housing, the Santa Cruz County Fair, and the National Night Owl. Staff recommends that the RTC direct staff to, to seek grant funds for a pilot bicycle incentive voucher program focused on lower income individuals to assist them with purchasing regular bikes, e-bikes, and e-bike sharing services. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Marino. Other comments or questions from commissioners? 
Commissioner Schiffrin. As I remember, there was a problem last time with the AB 2766 grant because of the concern that it didn't provide documentation that it would reduce vehicle miles traveled. Mm -hmm. What's being done to respond to that concern this time around? Yeah, our, our platform using um, Cruise 511, we do have the capability to, to get that data that they're looking for, including carbon reductions and be, the vehicle miles traveled um, numbers that we that would, would reduce. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be included, <laughs> including in our grant application. How will um, you do that? Yeah. We have, uh, so we'll be encouraging individuals who, once they receive their vouchers, to track their trips in our, in our platform. Um, and so we have our commute rewards that are just kind of constantly encouraging and incentivizing uh, individuals to log those trips. Um, but we're also, at the beginning of the voucher program, we have a baseline survey that will then establish what are some of the... Um, their existing travel, um, their travel behavior, and then uh, following up follow up surveys. So usually either at a six six month and then a year follow up to try to uh, figure out how they're riding their bike, what they're using it for, um, and getting some of those those metrics as well. Thank you. That, I, I think that's great and very going to be very important. I, I'm very supportive of this whole effort, um, and I think particularly that aspect of it that would provide discounted rates for the bike share program to people, given, um, as I think was mentioned before, that for many individuals living in small units, it's hard to store an, uh, an electric bike or even a regular bike. So being able to use the uh, bike share program at a affordable rate, um, which may be a challenge, um, is uh, important. So I'm definitely supportive of moving ahead as staff recommends. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer. Commissioner Dillis. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have two questions. First, um, if other incentives are available for folks that qualify for the voucher program, can you stack those different incentives? Yes, okay. yes. Great. Glad yeah. to hear that. Um, my other question is, is, is the application process simple for both the, the individual and for the business that might be selling the bike locally? We, yeah, that, the goal is to make it as simple as possible. Um, it'll be administered by Ecology Action, and they have this process set up for, with the City of Santa Cruz's program. But that's our goal. We really want to make it simple and provide materials that are easy to understand and very straightforward. So that's our goal is to do okay. that. And, yeah. and this would cover the entire county, as I understand? Yes, okay. yes. Great, yeah. thank you. And excuse me, commissioners, if, if, if I may add, part of our, our intent too is to make sure that we provide assistance to applicants in, in, in completing applications and to include providing that assistance in Spanish to anyone who might be interested in, in, in uh, uh, using the program that uh, cannot communicate well in English. Great. Thank you, Deputy Director Mendez. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. So. Am I correct that the ETA for the rollout for South County is 2024? Like, is that summertime or the beginning of, of 2024? Yeah, they have. I don't think they have a specific date, but early 2024, I think, is what they're shooting for. Um, but they, yeah, they they didn't have a specific time frame, just that it'll be in 2024. But hopefully, early 2024. Okay. Yeah. I think you answered one of my questions. Who's going to administer the program? Is it going to be ecology, ecology action in South County as well? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's probably two areas that are uh, probably good to promote this uh, when it rolls out in South County. And there's uh, the Fiestas Patrias, which is two different dates, May 5th and September 16th. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people go, awesome. like seven, 8,000 people, probably more than the Story Festival uh, for both those dates. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly Spanish speakers. And the other one is the... You mentioned Cabrillo, but specifically working with the Watsonville campus, too, with the students there. Um, and also just working with the bike shop there. I think we got one bike shop in Watsonville, Watsonville Cyclery, so it would be good working with them as well. And that, that's it. Those are my only questions. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Rockin. Well, I'm going to wait for the public comments. Okay. I just about to make a motion and realize that was premature. Yeah. Um, I have a couple comments. First of all, just want to applaud staff for the program that, that you brought before us today. Um, in, uh, in advance of this, I was 
reviewed a document that talked about some of the best practices of these kinds of, of uh, programs, and I'm seeing them represented here, including the fact that we're moving from a rebate to a voucher, uh, so that it's a lot easier for someone uh, low income to take advantage of, and also that we're focusing the program on low income individuals. Um, those are both cited as best practices, and so uh, I'm excited to see them incorporated here. Um, I had, uh, let's see, I, it's also great that we're sort of creating this centralized uh, program. Um, well, yeah, the question I had is, is for, if we have sort of over subscription or more applications than we can handle, how might we prioritize uh, folks to receive vouchers? Would it be based on you know, lowest income first? Uh, would it be on longest trips that they can solve for? Any sense of how we prioritize? Yeah, I think we, we've generally been looking um, really at the first come first serve aspect. Um, there's just so many coming in and we're, we're trying to do a balance of getting as many vouchers in, as possible while limiting the amount of administrative oversight that goes into something like this. And so the, the more criteria we add, the more, the more review we're adding, we're then taking money away from that program and, and putting it into to staff time. Um, and so we're, we're really just focusing on, on the, just the distribution of first come first serve, while also on the back end, just kind of doing an inventory as far as where are these, where are these applicants coming from and making sure that we're addressing that saying if all of these applicants are still coming in from maybe the Santa Cruz area and we're really trying to, to do outreach in South County, then that will tell us then that we need to up our game more in South County to get more applicants coming in. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a sound strategy to try to keep overhead low and, and ultimately get as much of this funding as possible into the hands of uh, the people that need the, the vouchers. Um, my other question, actually, rather than for staff, is sort of directed at uh, Commissioner McPherson, if he's if he's uh, online, and I can't see his screen, so I can't tell if he's uh, perking up or not. Um, but it's related to Central Coast Community Energy. I know that they had originally offered a bike rebate, and as far as I am aware, they no longer are offering that rebate. Um, I was just curious if there has been any discussion at the policy board for Central Coast Community Energy of bringing that back because of its popularity. Um, I know that with the AMBAG uh, or Monterey Bay Air Resources District, uh, they had staff, I think, was rec recommended they get rid of their e-bike voucher program, but then it was so popular and there was uh, so much support from the rest of their board that they continued it. So um, maybe the, I'm wondering if there's a p potential to uh, instigate the same sort of situation with 3CE since uh, they do have some resources. So uh, Commissioner McPherson, any Where's the discussion right. been we, on this? We did apply some of that. Uh, we are going to have an updated, uh, or I can't remember when our, we have an executive board meeting later today, but uh, that will be decided then. We will we'll, uh, discuss further what we're going to do for uh, such allocations in the near future, but I can't give you any specifics at this point. Okay, cool. good to know that the discussion is happening. Um, right. I, I'd certainly be in favor of it, including in um, you know our action today, just some communication with the Central Coast Community Energy Board. Officially speaking, I know that you're a great representative on that board, um, but just saying that we are taking best practices from these kinds of programs around the country, trying to create a consolidated and easy to use program, um, and we'd appreciate any additional funding that Central Coast Community Energy can contribute to uh, these kind of electric bike vouchers. Yeah, if I, it's a good suggestion. I think it'd be great if uh, the RTC sent a letter to Triple C E to say what we have done and the program that we're we're promoting here, and uh, send it to Three C E and say that we would surely love to have some uh, financial support for this from Triple C E. I think that'd be a great. Uh, uh, if I could recommend that we do that, I think that'd be really really great if we could. Okay, sounds good. We can uh, address that when we bring it back to the commission. For now, I'd like to open it up to public comment. If you have a comment uh, here in chambers, please approach the podium. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Claire and Com good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Claire Glogley. I'm the Transportation Planner for the City of Santa Cruz, and we administer the Go Santa Cruz Downtown Program. We have been operating our e-bike rebate program that this is modeled off of for the last almost year now, and it's been incredibly successful. 
We have a tiered rebate program that offers e-bike only rebates to both income qualified and non-income qualified individuals. Our program is a little bit different in that since it's focused on downtown and focused on commuters, our primary goal is to get as many people on bikes as possible and limit the barriers to entry. We've heard incredible feedback about the point of sale system, that it's a voucher, not a rebate, and the um, degree of certainty that folks have using that. The ability to stack these vouchers with um, other rebates that are available has been something that's led people to get deeper levels of discounts and lead them to purchase these bikes that are an investment, but also lead to bigger changes in, in travel behavior. And so we're, we're really excited that RTC is moving forward with this. Um, we're looking forward to, to partnering and continuing to promote this. We have over 600 people that we have denied from our program who are not located within the downtown. So there is an incredible latent demand outside of downtown for people who would immediately be willing and excited to jump onto this program. Um, to Commissioner McPherson's point, uh, the city of Santa Cruz would also love to write a letter to 3CE supporting expansion of their program. And finally, on a personal note, as a mom of two young kids, my family has a cargo e-bike and we take our two kids to two different schools, daycare and elementary school, and then to work frequently. And those trips would just not be possible without having an e-bike and the ability for me to jump on with a, a one-year-old and an almost eight-year-old and be able to get from the west side to Seabright to downtown twice a day is something that makes our trips easier, faster, more enjoyable, and frankly, just doable. So I'm looking forward to seeing more people have that ability and looking forward to seeing this program roll out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Glogley. <coughs> Anyone else here in chambers? Yeah, please approach the podium. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Joanna Edmonds. I'm the Transportation Coordinator at the City of Santa Cruz. Um, but today, I wanted to speak as a Live Oak resident and a recipient of one of the Go Santa Cruz e-bike <coughs> rebates, as well as I was lucky in that time period when 3CE was still operating there, so I got to use both. Um, this made a huge impact on our daily commutes. Um, for, I am a very experienced bike commuter on a regular bike. I started riding my bike to school in middle school as a student at UCSC and as an adult in this community. I've tried to ride my bike as much as possible whenever I could fit that in as an alternative to driving. And I've had many times where a bike was my only mode of transportation and I had no car. Um, even with all that experience and, and being in this field of work, when I hit a roadblock with bike commuting when I became a mother. Having two little kids, like um, others have experienced, having daycare and schools in different locations, um, it's very challenging with a regular bike. And as your kids grow, they can't fit in the um, trailer anymore. <laughs> so it makes, and they get heavier. Um, so I first heard about e-bikes and the cargo e-bikes that you could fit one or two kids on the back and with the assistance of the electric part, uh, battery, you would be able to ride a bike much easier um, with all that extra weight on the back. However, it, for my family, it wasn't financially attainable until I was able to get these um, bike rebates and the zero interest loan that's offered at most bike shops as well as through Ecology Action. So last year, um, when I was able to get these rebates and that loan, it changed everything for our commutes. Now I have an e-bike. I can fit my two-year-old and my six-year-old on the back of it. I can easily go to multiple places with them and drop them off before I get to work. This morning, for example, I dropped both kids off at different locations in Live Oak and I was able to get here in less than 30 minutes, pretty much the same as it would have been in a car. Purchasing an e-bike has been a game changer for us. And in the last nine months since we've had the e-bike, including as we're all aware, lots of rainy months when riding an e-bike wasn't really possible because we would get soaked. Um, we've still been able to clock 400 miles almost on our bike odometer without ever having to get in a car for those 400 miles. So that's a huge difference. Please continue your support of this program and expanding it so other county residents can also benefit from it. And the rebate program is an effective way to lower the barriers to e-bike ownership for people who just wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. <clears throat> and 
it's a really easy way for you to make an immediate impact to reducing drive alone trips in our county at a time when that's so important to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edmonds. Hi, I'm Sally Arnold, um, and I want to say that I'm on the Bicycle Advisory Committee to the RTC, and that I really, uh, we really enjoyed the presentation that was done uh, a couple of weeks ago about this, and I just really wanted to thank the staff. I see that they really incorporated a lot of the suggestions that were made at the time, and it's nice to feel like our participation was valued. Um, one of the things that came up in our discussion at the BAC was the idea about this, you know, the importance of including um, some subsidy for people who might want to try the bike share program. And it is partly, you know, we've thought it was a good idea, partly for the reasons that Mr. Schifrin presented about, you know, places to store something safely so it's not going to get stolen. That's not always available to everybody. But also for people who are like, no, 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 about the biking thing, you know, they can try it with a, a bike share. And if they learn to like it, then they might be willing to move to bike ownership. So it's a nice transitional kind of low barrier to entry way for people who are not confident about the, how biking might be useful to them. And um, you know, like other people here, I bike for a lot of my trips. I biked down here today um, and it's really, um, it's just a great way to move around the county. And I think it's great that you guys are considering um, it, making it available and encouraging more people to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. I'm Matt Farrell again from Friends of the Rail and Trail. We just want to uh, thank Commission staff and uh, those working on Bike Share Countywide for bringing this proposal forward. We think as you develop infrastructure in the community like the Rail Trail, uh, encouraging use of bicycles across class, race, and gender is a very important part of that activity. So thank you for considering this program. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone online who wishes to address us? Ecology action. Good morning. Confirming you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Again. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Matt Miller with Ecology Action. I'm a senior program specialist over there and help run the city of Santa Cruz, Go Santa Cruz e-bike rebate. Um, first, just want to uh, commend everybody, uh, Amy and Amanda, for uh, making quick work of this over the last couple of months, uh, taking this around and collecting feedback and incorporating it very actively. So above all else, I just want to, uh, you know, once again, uh, commit my support for this type of program. Um, the level of interest and impact we've seen from the very small downtown parking district program has been incredible. Um, and like Claire mentioned, we're, we're well over 700 people now who are sitting in the denied category who are not eligible. And we think that that's probably a fraction of the overall interest across the county. So we could be looking at, you know, potentially thousands of people who are uh, lining up to get an e-bike incentive. So this is a great opportunity to meet current demand, let alone demand that could be uh, created as a result of a program that comes online. A couple things that I wanna point out uh, that was from the uh, presentation, I think making trip tracking work, uh, as a requirement would be uh, really great just to fully understand and appreciate the impact and since the program since the the tracking uh through cruise 501 and ride amigos is in place i think that would be a great compliment in addition to baseline and uh post-purchase surveying at multiple stages i also want to point out that jules uh Mondejano, who's a, the owner of watsonville cyclery is is primed on this program and is excited about it has already been thinking about uh, reaching out to additional e-bike manufacturers to carry other brands. Um, so big picture, I think this is a great idea. Um, looking forward to having conversations and trying to support the rollout countywide. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ms. Jean Brocklebank. Hi, this is Michael Lewis this time. Um, while I'm a strong supporter of encouraging bicycling throughout the county, can you hear me? We yes. can. 
Okay. Well, I'm a strong supporter of bicycling throughout the county. I have a perspective to offer some cautions for the for getting more people on bicycles, especially the electric motorized bicycles. Uh, Gene and I walk throughout the county on uh, sidewalks in the neighborhoods from 41st Avenue to downtown Santa Cruz, and we frequently encounter bicycles, bicyclists riding on the sidewalk. And recently, we've encountered motorized bicycles on the sidewalk. Uh, consider that uh, class two bicycles can travel at 20 miles per hour, and class three, consider bicycles can uh, travel at 28 miles per hour. If you're driving in a car, that seems like that's pretty slow, but if you're on foot, that's terribly fast. And the bicycles on the sidewalk, especially the big motorized bicycles, are threatening to motorists, not only just fear, but for physical in the possibility of physical injury. We recently encountered a motorized bicycle on the sidewalk that had we been just a few seconds uh, earlier, it would have struck us because it, it was on a corner where we couldn't be seen. So we're asking that not only to promote bicycles, but we also want to promote a countywide ordinance to prohibit e-bikes and all of their bicycles from sidewalks in the county, just as the case is in Watsonville and is the case in commercial areas in Santa Cruz. Um, they, if we're going to encourage walking in our community as well as bicycling, we need to make sure that it is safe for pedestrians to walk on, on uh, the sidewalks without fear of being struck by a fast moving bicycle, a heavy, wide, fast moving bicycle that could offer severe injury and potentially even death to pedestrians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Piet Cannon. Good morning, commissioners. This is Piet Cannon with Ecology Action. I really wanna commend um, staff and, and commission for um, looking at these, these programs to get more people on electric bikes and regular bikes and bike share bikes. It's, it's just so crucial. Um, and I encourage you to put as many resources towards this program. Um, you know, one of the, you know, reducing VMT and, and these programs are, are showing that they do um, reduce VMT. There's a program in Denver that just started. It's much quoted, it's about, started about a year ago and they've already had 6,000 um, people that have purchased electric bikes through that program. And their data to date shows that those people, um, each individual uses on average 26 miles a, a week they bike and they take 3.4 um, trips per week. And those, those are trips that are re replacing car Mr. go Kidd. bikes. Yes. We lost you for a second, but I think, I think you're back. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, and, and so, you know, Ecology Action actually administered the program way back when in the early 2000s for e-bike incentive program that the RTC ran. Um, and we did um, baseline surveys, we did follow-up um, surveys, at least two follow-up surveys of the participants. And, Hundred people have participated in that program, so that was successful in the in the day when the electric bikes weren't weren't that good. Um, so, I just want to say, moving forward to to work with um, you know the experts or the you know experienced folks in the field to advance this program um, and to do it so we can reach the people who need it the most. You know that um, are burdened by the high cost of transportation, and this is the way to reduce. So, and one last thing about safety, you know, the Ecology Action Program has a safety um, component built into it. So participants are asked to take a, a short safety class and get quizzed on it to verify they took that class. Um, so we have a safety element built into it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. And our last speaker, Sean. might have hung up. Sean, if you're there, go ahead. All right. I think Let's we sing. lost him. Then, uh, Here we go. Here, give me one second. There's another hand up. Sean. Sean. Sean, we cannot hear you. Oh. All right, there we go. All right, yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if looking for... Um, 
uh, if you want to help that program grow, um, as far as uh, uh, giving uh, uh, giving uh, deep discounts for bicycles and e-bikes, I suggest reaching out to uh, a local nonprofit, Bivy Cart with two Bs, uh, two Vs, excuse me. Uh, Bivy Cart helps um, provide uh, bikes and sometimes carts for uh, at-risk and homeless veterans. So they could definitely uh, use uh, some partners to help uh, 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 to help reach more people. They've, they've got plenty of equipment. They could use some mechanics, um, but they also uh, are looking for more clients to get more stuff away to. Um, I have one question. Um, I, 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 during the presentation, I heard um, the phrase adaptive bikes. So I'm wondering if that's hand cycles. I'm wondering if that's for uh, people with uh, disabilities to use. Um, and uh, some years ago, the RTC uh, announced a uh, partnership with a, a Monterey program to help provide uh, 2,000 uh, bicycle parking spaces, including, uh, including lockers. So um, seeing these, how, how uh, these projects have been uh, successful, and, and this one's uh, you know, anticipated to be even more successful, um, that might be an option. Uh, for the future, if you know we can show that uh, that it's needed, I can I can see how they could, that that would help uh, if uh, if along the rail line, for instance, those uh, uh, that uh, parking space uh, bicycle bicycle parking spaces and lockers were were populated as long as well as uh, parks and and other uh, frequently uh, visited places. Thank you, Sean. That was our last speaker. Okay, um, would staff be able to uh, comment on what, what's meant by an adaptive bike? Yes, yeah, so that an adaptive bike would be a bike that would be used by someone, or by someone with disabilities. So it could be any, any sort of bike like that. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Commissioner Rocket. So um, first a comment, when you got six or 700 people stacked up that are waiting for this thing to happen, it's absolutely critical that the advertising program you have, which is a really good one in Watsonville particularly, happen for a couple of weeks or something before you open the date, because otherwise, bam, 600 people will do it, and that's the end of Watsonville. Um, so that's just one suggestion I make really strongly. Uh, after that, though, I will move the staff recommendation, direct okay. staff to write a letter to uh, 3CE requesting their participation and support of the program. Um, and there's one other part. I'll, I'll stop there unless I'll, I'll second, second it. it. Oh. Go ahead, Felipe. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Rock and a second by uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, I will just point out, I think typically like a letter would be written from the commission itself rather than staff. So coming from okay. the chair I'll of the correct, board as a representative. I'll my motion to reflect that. Okay, thank you. I have comments, a couple of Pretty comments or ahead. suggestions. Uh, while I can really appreciate a first come first serve approach uh, administratively, I think since there is a desire to really spread these around um, and um, the city of Santa Cruz has such an advantage because of the programs it had, it may make sense to allocate um, a certain proportion of the funding to other areas of the county, particularly in the South County. The second thing I wanted to uh, suggest, the discussion about having this bike share program countywide has been going on since before the pandemic. It's very complex because the unincorporated area is very large and where you store the bikes, how you get the bikes, it has been a difficult problem to solve. And I think it's become, it's been so difficult to solve that the city of Santa Cruz and the university, which have the experience with this program, have really just said, okay, we're moving ahead. Um, and I guess my suggestion, both to staff and maybe representatives from Watsonville and maybe Capitola, is that they really talk to their staffs about moving forward more quickly uh, with a program within their own communities. Uh, they're much more bounded, it's much more easy to control, um, and uh, you know, they, 
As I remember the staff report, it was going to be later in 2023 that we're going to have the countywide. And this is just, this is, we've, at the Board of Supervisors, we've been getting reports over the years about how this contract is working out. It's a tricky contract, and it's understandable why it's taking so long, but it seems a shame that the city of Santa Cruz is going to be able to move forward. The staff is moving forward with, um, you know, uh, obtaining funding for it. Um, and yet some of the cities which are sort of the where population is concentrated uh, are not being able, are not moving forward with their own programs. So I think it's worth considering um, that working with the, the public works directors in, in the cities to see if there's some way to kickstart the program within their communities while we wait for the countywide one, which hopefully will be uh, coming forward in the not too distant future. So I support the motion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And just to clarify, I mean, my staff is welcome to clarify, but my understanding is we've signed a single contract uh, as a unified group of cities and county uh, with B Cycle as the bike share operator. And so the phased rollout, I think, is just um, in, in some respects was, was part of that contract already and um, part of negotiations to just ensure the smoothest rollout possible. I, and I agree, I'm certainly eager to, to see it rolled out in the unincorporated area. Um, but I respect the complexity of the contract. Jack has a comment. Yes, Mr. Dillis. Thank you. Um, as a representative from Scotts Valley, um, I have a strong interest in us participating in the bike sharing program, but I understand we've just got so much going on, but there's some interest there. So, uh, and we certainly have a growing bike community. Um, I am wondering, uh, the grant funds that are being sought, particularly for the bike sharing program, the staff report looks like and your comments look like that's all about helping the, the folks get, uh, that, that would ride the, the bikes, the e-bikes. I'm wondering, is any of that money available for what I'll call the infrastructure that needs to go in to accommodate the, the bike sharing? So at the moment, the, the grants that we're going to be applying for are mm -hmm. just going to be for the point of sale vouchers for the e-bikes regular but in purchasing the bikes and not not for the e-bike sharing program. So we want to work with the work group um, to kind of to find out what exactly would, we're going to be offering. And then we're going to have to go seek separate fundings or or maybe from the RTC discretionary funding in the fall. So we don't have that uh, funding yet, but we'll, be, we'll definitely be updating the commission on once we have that in details. So we could be part out. of that discussion then, obviously. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, just to be clear, I'm very supportive of the motion. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Tellis. Commissioner Rodkin. Just, just to clarify the motion, the, this motion leaves staff some discretion in terms of how they roll this program out. And Andy's suggestion earlier, for example, Commissioner Schifrin's suggestion that you know, because Santa Cruz has such a head start on this, we have to be, and I made my, the comment about advertising it before you let it loose. Nothing prohibits you from holding back a certain number of these and stuff to see, you know, what happens with folks in Watsonville and so forth. What, what it doesn't do is the, you know, let's, let's start figuring out people's income levels and who, you know, as your argument was, let's not spend our energy and money and time on staff to process this whole thing. So it doesn't open that possibility, but you have a lot of discretion about the way this actually gets rolled out. And I didn't set a timeline on how much, how long it has to be advertised in Watsonville before you can open it up to the public and so forth. So that, that's up to staff to work those details out. Thank you for that clarification. You've got can some Can I ask uh, for a clarification? I maybe misheard what staff said about the funding that's being applied for. Um, my understanding was that it was going to be applied for both the voucher program and the bike share program. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's, it's generally it's we're we're trying to figure out what that fund amount would we would be we would be offering for the bike share uh, membership. So as part of the whole negotiations that the working group did to to get those discounted rates for UCSC students, um, they had. They were working together and had some years of negotiations there. RTC wasn't involved in those conversations uh, or wasn't a part of that. And so trying to go in now into this, it's going to take some time to figure out how we can get those discounted memberships. And so we're trying to align that and potentially have this entire pot of funding for these different elements. Okay. Um, Andy, their response earlier was to the question of whether we would spend this money to subsidize the actual, or you know, the racks and 
placements of the bicycles themselves, and that's done by the private sector, I think. No, uh, my question is, in the grant application to the Air Board, will part of the funding be that's being applied for be available for the bike share program? That's our intent. Okay, that's all I'm concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer. And all right, if there are no other comments or questions, we have a motion from Commissioner Rock and a second by Commissioner Schiffer for uh, adoption of the recommended actions with additional direction for uh, the chair to send a letter to 3CE encouraging them um, to continue offering funding for these sorts of uh, voucher programs. If there's no further discussion, clerk, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Peterson. Commis Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commission Alt Commissioner Alternate Dillis. Aye. Commissioner Montesino. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. And Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. That concludes uh, the, well, the commission will now move into closed session. Council, is there any reportable actions that we anticipate from closed session? We are not anticipating any reportable action today. Okay. Um, we will take five minutes to transition the room into, I'm sorry, yes. Can I make a public comment on closed session? Sure, please. Thank you. Um, good, I guess we're afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioners Grace Blakesley. I'm a member of your staff, and I'm also a member of the core union of the RTC staff members. Um, my comments today are my own and don't reflect all of the comments from the core staff. Um, the RTC executive director did not inform staff that this item would be on the agenda in advance of placing it on the agenda. And therefore, CORE did not have time to meet between um, seeing the item notice last Thursday um, and today's meeting. RTC staff did receive notice from the core union representative that the RTC would be discussing in closed session the staffing assessment. RTC staff received a copy of the staffing assessment in January. It was completed as a draft um, and prepared by an outside consultant. RTC core did have several questions and requested additional information. While advancing the RTC goals, uh, RTC staff often does work with consultants to prepare um, an analysis, but before bringing findings to you, staff seeks input from the stakeholders and affected persons to resolve questions and concerns before bringing those findings before you. It help, this also helps us to ground truth the information and allows us to resolve, find, uh, allows us to resolve issues before bringing these to you. This step has not been completed for the staffing assessment, which I think you'll notice resulted in incomplete analysis, which many staff have noted is a flawed analysis. And it may not actually reflect the staffing needs, which is why I feel like it's important to, to communicate with you and speak today. This approach of not seeking input from staff is really different from the other pieces of development of the strategic um, and organizational assessment that RTC has been un undertaking. The process of developing core values was very inclusive, as well as development of a strategic plan for the agency. And it's not clear why um, its staff input was not solicited on the staffing assessment by the, completed by the outside consultant. So as a staff member committed to implementing RTC's goals and serving the public, I wouldn't feel comfortable implementing the staff assessment as described without additional information about roles and responsibilities of each position, job descriptions, and justification about how it serves the agency, and also with input from the RTC staff currently completing the work. I feel fortunate to work with the staff so committed to high quality work products and applying their expertise to respond to the needs of Santa Cruz County residents and visitors. And I personally hope we can maintain that high quality work and service and staff. I suggest that the executive director work collaboratively with RTC staff to come forward with a joint recommendation to any changes in the organizational structure if appropriate. And that one that implements the core values the, uh, the it implements the agency's core values adopted um, by staff in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blakely. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment on the closed session? All right, seeing none, we'll uh, take a short break uh, to transition the room to closed session. And uh, we are going to meet in the side room right over here and we'll plan to get started around 1130. Thank you.